Big hand for Dr. S.K. Mathur. Decency personified, Dr. S.K. Mathur. Something is a Padam Bhushan A, and beside that is a human being par excellence. We are very proud to meet him tonight. I will not take further time, but I invite Dr. Sheikh Gupta to say a few words about Dr. Vishwanath and go ahead to see him. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's my proud privilege this evening to invite Dr. Mithal sir for the lecture. Uh, sir is the first DM endocrine from All India Institute and has, uh, is one of the most well recognized uh, cases in the field of endocrinology and diabetes in India and abroad. He subsequently went on to be faculty and manage the SGPGI uh, department division of endocrinology. And uh, right now he is the chairman of Medanta in, uh, Institute of Endocrinology and Diabetes. Sir has done human uh, work in the field of osteoporosis and thyroid and his work is widely quoted the world over. It's a proud privilege to have him this evening and also despite his stature and extremely busy schedule, he is just a phone call away. When I am stuck, he is my go-to man and he has been extremely, extremely benevolent enough to help me out and likewise many others, uh, you know, of our colleagues. Uh, may I invite Dr. Mithal sir for the talk? Uh, to be presented on the uh, management algorithm of type 2 diabetes and I am very sure we would be enriched with his personal uh, experience and his personal tip off for all of us. Dr. Mithal sir. Uh, it's, uh, I don't need all these words, thank you very much anyway. I mean, this is like home, this is like family. Uh, we are all part of South Delhi Physicians Forum and I am always happy to be here. If I had my way, I would, I would attend every Wednesday. But my schedule sometimes, you know, turns a lot. So because I'm very much part of you guys, all of you. So uh, let's talk today. I was first thinking of doing the whole management algorithm, and I thought that would become too unwieldy. So uh, you know, or too basic, and you would get bored. So I think the important, one of the important areas in, in diabetes management is truly uh, uh, regarding insulin. Uh, and myths regarding insulin. And very many times in busy practice, <coughs> it is the truth that patients are not offered insulin by many of us simply because we don't have time. And to avoid the hassle of explaining, convincing, because it takes a lot of time to convince anybody to go on insulin. That is the truth. Yet, the importance of insulin therapy and how it, should, it is important even in type 2 diabetes. So let's today look at the ways to initiate our type 2 diabetes patients on insulin. We are not talking about type 1 diabetes. That is a separate story. That is insulin from day 1. And that's almost always basal bolus therapy. Now let me at the outset tell you that I am pretty much a basal bolus person. Which means there are two broad insulin regimens. One is a basal plus bolus which means one long acting insulin with three or four short acting boluses, right? And the other is using premixed insulin twice a day, which is using, uh, you know, mixture of intermediate and short acting twice a day. Now, India is a premixed market. It's a cliche or most we know that most of us use premixed insulin. In my environment, in the kind of hospitals I've always worked, in multi-specialty, in, in, in big hospitals with complicated cases, chronic cases, chronic kidney disease, post CABG, all those kind of post transplant, we are big users of basal and bolus. And we are probably the biggest users of analogs in, as a single center uh, in, in this country. And that's because of the kind of patients we see, not for any other reason. So I will today however talk about premix because I thought in clinical practice, sitting in your clinic, Premix usage is very high, and I thought it's good to clear the difference between that and basal bolus, and how should we start the patients on on insulin. Sunil Mishra has prepared this talk, so I put his name there. He, he's a he's an associate director in, in our division at Medanta. So why should we use insulin? What is the important? A little bit more expensive. Who should be started on premix insulin? How should we do that? And what is the experience from data? And what, what to do about oral antidiabetics when you start people on insulin? There was a time, it's an American concept. 
There was a time that patients who were started on insulin, their oral antidiabetics were stopped completely. And I had these patients visiting from US as tourists in India who were 120 kg in weight and taking 200 units of insulin and were still uncontrolled and were on no OHAs. Over the years, it has become apparent that to control type 2 diabetes to your satisfaction, to your goal, it cannot happen with insulin alone. Almost always you will require an oral antidiabetic in place. So one fundamental issue is what we were taught as undergraduates that insulin is supreme, yes it is. But to control a type 2 diabetes only on with insulin is very, very difficult. Very, almost impossible. We see that every day. So in our practice, for example, because we do a lot of surgical practice, meaning surgical clearances and management very operative, we don't discontinue OHA unless there is a complication, unless someone has kidney disease or some other thing. I'm talking of regular patients. We don't discontinue OHAs till the day before the surgery. You try doing that. We were taught when we were students that the moment patient comes into the hospital, to stop all OHA. Patient has to go for a coronary bypass surgery, okay? And put the patient on multiple insulin shots. Try doing that and see how well the patient is going to be controlled. So, what I'm trying to emphasize is that insulin therapy does not mean transiting to insulin. It means adding on insulin often to existing OHA or a modified OHA pattern. That's very important. I still see those prescriptions when people start insulin, they stop all OHA. It won't work. You'll be struggling. Because type 2 diabetes is insulin deficiency plus insulin resistance. If you're going to just fix insulin deficiency, what about insulin resistance? You need molecules that will enhance insulin action. So don't forget that. So why insulin therapy? Analogs, premix, premix, explain some studies and issues regarding OED. So let's look at this gentleman. This is a 62 year old gentleman. Duration of type 2 diabetes is 13 years. Typical patient for the OED. 75 kilograms, not grossly overweight. In fact, not at all overweight. Almost uh, ideal weight. Uh, current treatment is also very difficult, given practice is quite far. Many of your patients, most of your patients are in that. Lab results showing 8.7. Now, patient is not so bad about lifestyle, actually. But he wants to improve his control. So, how would you help this patient reach his goal? This, this is the kind of logbook he is presenting to you. You say, okay, let me first figure out what you do. So you say, monitor your sugars and come back. This is the kind of reading that you are getting, okay? 8.7 A1C, fasting 140, 160. Post means touching 200. It's not working. Touching 200 after breakfast and, and 190 and all after lunch. You can see that. And after dinner is again 200 plus. So there is high postprandial and there is off, thank you. There is high postprandial and the fasting are also high. Now this patient is only a glimperide metformin. So what would you do for such a patient? Would you add an additional oral agent? Would you consider that? If yes, which one would you consider? Any thoughts? So people would consider DPP-4 inhibitor, which is a pretty good sort of molecule to add on. He has a fairly good lifestyle, by the way. I said that, regimented lifestyle. Okay, so some people would consider DPP-4. Would you consider TZDs, glitazones, uh, bioglitazone? Would you consider that? No. You could consider that. I think wrong in considering that. Uh, there are issues with bioglitazone and glitazone which are a little contentious, uh, including weight gain and fetal edema and other things and weakening of bones. He's in the older age group. You have to be careful, but yes, you could consider it. It's not wrong to consider it. Would you consider SGLT2 for it? Yes. You would. Right. So let's look at the guy again. His BMI is 23.8. While that doesn't exclude SGLT2, 
it doesn't make it that you have a first choice for such a patient. Because you will lose some weight and you will have this wife calling you every day, keep your chair up, it's not going to be a good idea. So, we keep it in the shop, the chair up, but it's not going to be a good idea. So, this is it. 120 kg patients, you put them on SGLT2 and they will, their wives will come in, they will come in, they will come in. So we have a peculiar psychology, but anyway, so, so I think this is important to remember that not a great choice, but yes. Would you add a basal insulin at bedtime? Do you do that? It's a good option because the patient is 140, 160, but the patient is going up by 100 points after meals. So it is possible that a basal insulin alone may not do the trick, <coughs> right? You, because if you bring down the fasting to 100, you still have to be of 180, 190, 200. So it's a bit iffy. Would you begin a premixed insulin therapy? Would you consider premixed insulin at this stage? You could consider it. It will fulfill many of your needs. But you know, as I said, all options are open. All, and please don't do the last. Stop OEDs and start with the bodiless therapy. You stop OEDs only when there's an indication to stop OEDs. CKD is a prime example. You know, there you have to stop everything. Or someone who's, for whatever reason, hospitalized, is that. But basically, you don't have to stop OEDs, all OEDs. So, uh, why would you not stop OEDs? It's perfectly okay. No, it's not. Why? Because you will not be able to attain the kind of control you would want to in a patient where you are putting on insulin unless there is a reason to stop OED. So there is no reason to stop an insulin sensitizer like metformin, for example. You would not be able to stop metformin in a patient of type 2 diabetes unless there is a reason to stop it. If there is a reason, you will stop it. Otherwise, you will, you will not be able to control it. Well. I can tell you that by experience as well as by data. Uh, I would request the uh, audience to please ask the question at the end because sir has a meeting to attend to. So we'll try and explain that. Let's please uh, uh, get it complete, please. So look at this second patient. Yeah, second patient. Patient with type 2 diabetes on OEDs, but A1C is 10.5, not 8.7. Okay, I forgot one point. In the first patient, why is it more but It's an okay choice. Why is it not a fantastic choice? Because the A1C is 8.7, you don't expect a drastic reduction in A1C with DPP4. You will come down to 8 maybe. If you are very lucky, 7.8. You won't come to 7 if that's your target. So it's not a far, it's a good molecule but not a powerful molecule in that sense. Uh, A1C is 10.5. Now this is much easier choice. If A1C is 10.5 and the patient is on 3 drugs, so you don't have too much choice. We have seen 10.5 and, and, and it's sufficient already on giving right metformin is a target 10. 10.5, what's going to work? He has predictable daily routine also. He's not a bad patient in that sense. So you would, how would you decide A1C goal and how, how would you decide choice? Again, the same choices. Here, of course, additional oral agent can be considered, you can still consider SGLT2. In this patient, if patient is obese or overweight and if patient is unwilling for injectables, you would still fall back on that. Otherwise, you would definitely think of adding uh, insulin. Would you prefer basal or premixed for this particular patient? So, one of the rules of the thumb that we use, there's no, there's no hard and fast rule in this. One of the rules of thumb that we use is that if A1C is above 9, basal alone may not be sufficient. This is not a gold sort of rule, golden rule, but it helps in decision making in the opening. If the A1C is over 9 and patient is compliant otherwise, just adding basal insulin may not be the trick. And it may be good to add a premix or a basal bolus star. Okay? So insulin is the most powerful agent that we have. There is no upper limit to insulin dose. So patients get hassled. One of the reasons they get hassled is that we start with low doses of insulin. So when you start largely, you start with 8 or 10 units, then you increase by 2 units every third day. When you start uh, pre-mix, you start with 10 units twice a day or 10 or 6 or something. And despite explaining to the patient that we are starting with low dose, by the time the dose reaches 14 or 16, patients are very hassled. You say to the tablet, 
So this is, you have to explain, this is quite a lot of counseling. That I always tell them, I expect the average person. Indians are not being users of basal plus therapy. Do we know what is basal plus therapy? We all know basal bolus. Basal bolus is, one basal insulin and bolus is before each meal. Right? Basal plus is, one basal insulin and one or maybe two short acting insulin to cover one meal. So supposing, you added basal insulin to somebody and his sugars are okay or her sugars are okay except post breakfast or except post lunch. Supposing sugars are rising only after one meal. In that case, you may want to add a short acting only for that meal. So that is basal plus therapy. Right? And of course basal bolus that we know that three shots before each meal or sometimes even four shots. And, and a lot of things. Now, it is good to mention one point here. Somebody may wonder why analogs versus, versus conventional human insulin. So there are pros and cons of both. This talk is not about that. But the question is, I know, very common. So I'll address it right now. Broadly speaking, when you use analogs, they are faster absorbed. So you get a sharper rise in insulin level, and you blunt the post prandial response. So you get better PP control with analogs, number one. Analogs can be given just before the meal. Whereas conventional human insulin has to be given half an hour to 40 minutes before the meal. Which in real world is very hard. You yourself decide if you have taken insulin before breakfast, you are rushing to see your patients are waiting. So these little, little things make a difference. The problem with analogs, what is the problem? Nothing is always completely good, you know, there's always some problems. The problem with analogs is that the action doesn't often last till the next week. So a lunchtime short acting insulin, this floor as part, often does not cover till dinner time. Because it escapes, especially in type ones of course, because they have no insulin, but it tends to escape at that time. So these are the pros and cons of using uh, basal uh, conventional insulin versus that one. So, the goal is to improve fasting glucose, basal insulin, gold standard, no question. Glargine or whatever you like. Nowadays, Degludec, now there's 2 Geo, whichever you like. But Glargine is sort of a good one to remember, right? If goal is to improve BP glucose alone, supposing someone has okay readings but only the PPs are going up and despite you adding alpha glucose adding inhibitors like OBE balls and all, it's still not done then you may want to add a prandial insulin. We don't do this commonly. We think the post-prandial risers are almost always linked to carbohydrate intake in the meal. And if you can push them, manage their diet, you can get it down. But you may require this alone sometimes. So alone prandial insulin is not commonly <coughs> But it can be used, it's a legitimate strategy. If goal is fasting plus PPG, you will continue either OAD for post-prandial with basal, can be oral drugs with basal, so you can do the glyptin metformin, whatever, plus you add a basal for the fasting. So glyptin metformin for PP and basal for basal insulin for fasting. Or you go for, for prefix metabolics, or you go for basal bolus therapy, that is obvious. But to achieve optimal control, you have to get both fasting and PP under control. So everyone has their own take on this. So, so there you are. ADA follows that also. AOC more than nine, you may do basal plus therapy or premix less than nine, you can do just a basal. Uh, IDF says anything. Every, everyone has their own this thing. Okay. So, but this is a broad clinical guideline that we use. Nine percent is a good cutoff. If it's above nine percent, basal alone will not do the trick. We are also aware of all the all the available preparations, we are aware of NPH, we are aware of Detimate, not commonly used, we do not be aware. Glargine is, is, is common, the most commonly used, a lot of generic brands also available. Uh, Premixed is the one that is very commonly used in India, so many kinds. We are all aware of human insulin 3070, human mixed art, all those things. Humalog mix, Eglucent. You are aware of all these brands. These are pre-mixed insulins. But of course, you have you may have just the 
the, the, the short acting version also because that is this probe that may be just there but commonly used brands which are things insulins you may have just regular insulins or as I said you may have this probe as part of blue lysine just before me which we just discussed the difference between that and the regular insulin and this is important the, the kinetics have to be understood Sorry. The kinetics have to be understood well, and here we are. This is the regular. See the orange line here? This is conventional human insulin, human insulin R or human actor plate or whatever you call it. This is here. This is Listro or Aspart. Sharp rise mimicking normal human physiology of insulin secretion also. Now you of course have ultra short acting and all that, but you're not going into that. We have detriment which you can ignore. NPH is everyone knows NPH forever. NPH, this look at the variation here. That is the problem with NPH. Good insulin, better than not using intermediate acting, very cheap, but this is a problem. Right? And glargine of course you know. So if you look at different regimens, what happens with, with, with uh, untreated, of course, this is there. When you use a basal, see, the whole graph comes down, right? The postprandial excursions don't come down. The difference between pre and post does not come down. The overall line comes down. So the line comes down from here to here. But the excursions are maintained. Pura graph up and you pull down the yes. Without changing the shape of the graph. Right? If you use a premix or a basal bonus and you're using pandil plus basal insulin, then obviously you not, not only pull down the graph, but you also pull down the skirt. That is the basic difference. So again, repeating for premix. Beyond target with basal insulin, more than 9%. Portal agent failure, meaning you reach the maximum tolerated dose. I don't like the word portal agent failure, but nevertheless, maximum tolerated dose, contraindication, cost issues, cost of oral agents is not low anymore. Let me also tell you, we all keep complaining about so many things, but insulin price is pretty well controlled in this country. 90% of the patients in sitting, uh, you know, in remote areas don't require a drug, they require regular insulin. That price is one of the cheapest in the world. Okay, so that's why when the BMG editor, you, you, are you aware of this episode? When the BMG editor, who is a very sort of socialist uh, activist kind of lady, very brilliant, obviously she's an BMG editor. She came here and gave an inter interview to Economic Times, saying that 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 uh, insulin is being thrust upon Indian patients who don't require it. It is all driven by industry. And, and uh, uh, there is no need for these patients to be on insulin, all kinds of stuff. Uh, which is really bizarre, which was pathetic. I mean, it's so in any case, we are struggling to move our patients to insulin. And she went on to say insulin is expensive and this is all a doctor. Pura bolas, pharma, excess, I wrote a stinker of a response to that. Uh, on social media and everything, and I said, the Economic Times should really worry about what it's saying and you know, worry about their own credibility if they are quoting such things. But we are struggling to convert our patients to insulin. And people are dying of complications because they don't take insulin. Someone just flies in and gives this gyan to us that you know, everything will be wrong. So this is not right. Oral agent failure is not a great thing, but cost is not a real reason to keep your patient on insulin. That's what I'm trying to say. You have enough brands, whichever company you like, whichever brand you like, you have enough cheap brands because the prices of the non-analog insulins are all the same. They're tightly regulated by the So you need to know that. Uh, diet history, of course, that makes a big difference in India, especially people missing lunches. My, my surgical diabetes friend, surgeons, they have a big problem with insulin because they don't have lunch sometimes. I mean, most doctors are very irregular about their lunch. So you have to be very, very cautious in, in treating such people. So, so then also when you have put someone on insulin, basal insulin, right? Standard, you start someone on glargine. When do we start worrying about 
it's not working enough, we have to do something else. The important point is, if you have normalized the fasting glucose with Gaji and still the PP is high or A1C is high, then you worry about what you do now. So patient the patient asks, if you have the insulin, if you control it, but fasting is controlled, if you have the insulin, you will get hypoglycemia. So then you say, no, this insulin will not work. You will have to add either a bolus or move the patient to the Whenever you are going off, off average dose of glargine, typically if you are using just glargine with OADs, if you are hitting 40 units, there is a problem. There is something wrong, you need to do something else. A rule of the thumb, these are practical points that I am telling you, okay? So if you are using glargine, you are hitting 40 units, it means something has to be added somewhere. And if fasting is normal and A1C is still above your target, you need to add a candidate insulin. So you could use premix insulin as target insulin <coughs> in those who have higher A1Cs. You cover post target also well. So you identify your patient, optimize OADs. Now, when you are on premix insulin, you may want to reduce secretor box. When you are in basal insulin, you continue all OADs. When you are in premix insulin, the role of sulfur urea starts declining. And you may want to limit your OADs to metformin, leptin, and now SGLT2. You can use sulfur urea. It's not at all prohibited, but the role becomes limited because you're giving insulin anyway. The role of a secretor cow is different. Glyptins are different, they have glucagon actions, they have other actions. Sulfur urea is straight secretor cow. So its role is limited there. You have to select the kind of insulin, make sure that you demonstrate the insulin technique or someone does it on your behalf. Without that, it's all useless. Even now in the evening, I saw a patient. 40, 40, 40, 60, and all kind of regimen, you know, basal molars, and we see all these kind of patients all the time. And the simple problem was that patient is injecting into the hypertrophic site again and again because it hurt there. So, you know, it makes no sense why, why uh, patient should not be controlled on such high dose. So, technique is very important and always start with low dose and titrate gradually because you never know incidence sensitivity of a patient. There is no formula for that. And the formula, whatever are there, are very unreliable. Start with low dose up titrate, but tell the patient, I expect your dose to be given some high figure so that he doesn't bother you every day. Now, you obviously will up titrate or down titrate based on the readings. There is no doubt about that. You have to check for hypoglycemia. Very, very important. And you will check your EMH. So, it doesn't work. Most of the patients will not be a two-third, one-third kind of regimen. Okay. How do you start starting those as Western, uh, Western guidelines? If you have, if you're starting with a single dose of premix, which I don't do commonly, in my hands or in my team actually, we start premix twice a day, typically. We don't usually start premix once a day. Odd cases may be there. We do start co-formulations of Deglodec and as part once a day sometimes. But not typical premixes, you will start twice a day. But there are different formula you can use. If you're using up to 10 units, you can use it once. Using more than 10 you think you require, you can split into two. But it really depends on your patient profile. These days, everything is individualized. The, the use of continuous glucose monitoring Libre-Pro, I strongly recommend for your patients. It is a simple fax stuck on the upper arm and gives you a reading for 15 days. And the cost is not high. <coughs> Somewhere 2 to 3,000 rupees for a 15 day glucose chart. And then you can decide where to add your insulin, which one is required, and which is It's worth it. It's worth it. So continuous monitoring has come to stay. I am telling you in 5 years, maybe even less 3 years, this glucose strip monitoring will rapidly go up. You will at least in the paid, you know, private environment. You will find everyone going around with those stickers on that. Because the cost will keep coming down as it will increase. So I think that's that's the way we should do. So okay. Root of the thumb, 10 12 units you can start with once a day. But if you're going above that, then we want to start with split doses uh, twice a day. This is how you will adjust you will adjust based on, 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 on what you find uh, as the glucose value. So you will adjust the morning dose based on the pre-dinner value. You will adjust the evening dose based on the morning value. 
but there is a problem. It's, it's all easy to describe and discuss. It's not doesn't work in real world often. What does work is if you are just purely on the basis of pre dinner value, sometimes pre lunch hypos will happen. If you are just purely on the basis of fasting value, sometimes midnight hypos will happen. So you have to take a holistic picture. This is why I was saying user technology is good, but in general, this is the time. In general, this is the guideline. Morning dose, pre breakfast dose based on this. evening sugar, evening dose based on morning sugar. Right? That's how we do it. So if you look at, at, at a comparison, if obviously if you're using BID premix versus a basal insulin, a BID premix will give better control. One shot will not be able to match up to two shots. This is a comparison of, of, of Lispro mix 25 egg using or hemolog or whatever versus glargine. And you can see that percentage of patients who attain treatment targets is higher with the with the Lispro mix rather than with glargine. Because you're using one shot there and two shots there and you're using prandial insulin there, you're using only with it. So it's not a fair comparison. But just to explain that it works very well. This is important and is exactly as expected. Uh, what is the okay? This gray line is the basal line. This is where you added glargine. When you add sorry, the gray line is the glargine line, and the orange line is the is the premix line, right? So when you add glargine, let's look at the fasting sugar. Which will lower fasting sugar better? Glargine, right? So you see the gray dot here. It is lower than the orange dot. So glargine works excellently well, very well for fasting blood glucose. Look at the post prandial excursions. Which will lower it better? It will be premix. So you see that very clearly. So with glargine, better lowering of fasting. With premix, better lowering of post sugars. And that's what is evident. Uh, here, the difference is not so much in the post lunch. In my experience, when we use premix twice a day, very often post lunch is left uncovered. And if you carefully monitor post lunch sugar, you will find many times there. And that's the thing, that is the problem of premix. But also, in this case, effective MRC control, control of both fasting and PP, an option to intensify, you can go on and take the dose. Limitation is daytime hypo, pre lunch hypo, nocturnal hypo is slightly higher. Somewhat more weight, weight, weight gain, and already have probably no coverage of lunch time. Right? And less flexible. You are just long acting also, if you are just short acting because it's premixed, that is a challenge. After you have a time, you will put us a prandial in the This is the baki to cheek, like in breakfast, you will have to do it. But if you are morning, you will have to do it, not increasing only the short acting, you long acting also. You will have to do it, you will have to do it. That is always a disadvantage of premixed. Okay, now look at this. This is a very good slide actually. This shows premix insulin versus basal insulin. And this is a talk on premix insulin, but my talk does not change based on the forum. Okay, so what do you see here? In fasting glucose level, premix and the log. If you are to the left of this line, it favors premix. To the right of the line, favors basal. So every study showed that basal insulin is better than premixed for control of fasting glucose, right? Which is rational, intuitively correct. But if you look at postprandial, then, then you find that it is going the other way, right? So the same point being made, which I have already explained to you in the talk. Again, when you look at A1Cs, overall, if you're looking at just one shot of long-acting versus two shots of premix, you will find that you find better A1C control in premix, which is again very logical and not very difficult to understand. So what about OADs? If you're using premix, metformin to be continued unless contraindicated. Always continue metformin unless there is a reason to stop it. Right? Clitazones in insulin combinations are used minimally. I use them minimally anyway, but they are not commonly combined with insulin because it, it causes more fluid retention and so many other issues, more weight gain. 
They said it's going to determine you continue all OATs. You can continue surgery also. In premix, you can continue sulfonylurea and DQ4 initially, but typically we take the sulfonylurea, lower the dose or take it off. DQ4 now is continued almost always. Now, what about recommended daily tests? Now, this is another question. What about your self-monitoring of glucose? Moment you put in insulin, you need more monitoring. That is true. The guidelines about self-monitoring are, are bizarre, erratic and vague. So you have to do it based on your clinical experience. I think when you have a patient incident, you have to educate the patient about SMBG, self-monitoring. And I think you have to, without that, don't start insulin. If the patient is not going to do self-monitoring at all, don't start insulin. The frequency of monitoring can depend on the complexity of the regimen the patient is on, requirement for type control, risk of hypoglycemia, that will decide how frequently you are. But do not start insulin in somebody who will not fight for blood glucose at home. That is again. You know, the new glucometers, the, 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 the value comes directly on the phone, patient's phone, and also on our phone. We are using it in patients. We have an app by which if someone measures the blood sugar, it can come on the phone directly. So that is impossible. When you have 150, 200 patients with diabetes. So at least the hot spots come to the consultant on call. The hypos and the hyper over 350 or under 70, they will come on the phone. Without, so you are just checking the glucometer and all this is happening. So these things are going to be commonplace very soon. They already are becoming commonplace. The new glucometers are all having these facilities. Accuracy, they have exhausted. They have built as much as they could. Time of testing, how does it matter? 15 seconds, 10 seconds or 12 seconds, they keep. So now they are moved there. The new glucometers have an app that you can download on your phone and the patient, all the charts, all the analysis is already done when the patient comes to you. So coming towards the end, who are the patients where we use premix analogs? Middle aged to old patients with fixed meal pattern analogs. Those who have very erratic lifestyle are not good for premix. Use a basal bolus there. Because if you're going to give a premix in the morning, that and patient doesn't have lunch, there is a problem. If you are going to give a, a short acting analog in the morning, then it will wash away by lunch time. You won't get high. Patients with high A1C, that I already emphasized, and on OADs, patients who are finding difficulty with 30 minute streaks, very practical. This is, these are slides that we discuss in the department. These are not things often written in textbook. That patients do find it difficult to take and that's a good reason to go on that path, right? And of course, those who are vulnerable to hypoglycemia, when you're looking for better postprandial control. Definitely, the simplicity of a premix makes it easy to use because less, there's no error of mixing and all those things are already finished. So what do the guidelines say? Premix insulins are an alternative approach to starting insulin therapy. You can initiate therapy with one or two shots of premix insulin. Two injections per day rather than four injections per day is an advantage for convenience, compliance, adherence of the patient. If failing on basal insulin, you can transit to premix insulin because he, despite failing on basal, patients will not want to go on basal bolus very often. They don't want four shots. And SMBG, at least twice a day when you're titrating, later on it can become less, is important. Fasting and before dinner. And concomitant OADs, while secretagogues become less important with premix insulin, it is not mandatory to discontinue even suffering immediately. You can taper it off, slowly depending on the response. And if someone is doing fine with the combo, you can continue that without having to change. So I think it's it's pretty important that that we realize the pros and cons of using insulins, which type of insulin, and two broad areas are important to understand. Conventional versus analog, basal approach, basal plus basal uh, bolus versus premix. And if we choose it carefully, we can get most of our patients in a reasonable control. And therefore, Copernicus uh, could be wiser to know that we know and what we know, and to know that we do not know what we do not know. I think now you know, 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 you know
ये जानना बहुत जरूरी है कि क्या हम जानते हैं ये भी जानना बहुत जरूरी है कि क्या हम नहीं जानते राइट तभी हम डिसीजन सही करते हैं थैंक यू वेरी Reading a paper when they get fed up of these uh, tricks on the fingertips, can we do the tricks even on the palm? Apparently, the paper said that they give a reasonably equivalent kind of a blood sugar. Yeah, people are even making it on fingers. On the fingers are more sensitive. Right. But still, you can do it. For now, it's well established. Two very important things, sir. The sliding scale doesn't exist anymore for yes. all of us. Yes. Yes. And uh, must we've, uh, I mean, this is a bigger thing than I thought a yeah. few years ago, because now we check everybody. Also, have the luxury of having 14 educators in our team. So, and, and it's amazing how much improvement in controls happen with insulin technique corrections. I always thought it was important, but added advantage is so important. It's unbelievable that before you do anything, because we used to go on attacking diet, diet. And of course, check the sites ourselves. But how much can you do when they're printing and printing outside? You can do much more tweaks, more sites, all that. But when you have someone going into each of those, it makes a difference. So injection site technique management is unbelievable. Very quickly, my favorite story about insulin technique management. To do that, we sometimes use an orange, right? Because our orange skin is like human skin a little bit. So, uh, especially for international patients where they don't understand the language, sometimes we our educators explain using an orange is that okay? So this guy is well controlled in hospital, and we explained everything. Uh, you know, my educator explained, and then you know how to inject and everything. This is all you have to do. And and the patient comes back after one week, and I get angry at everybody. How come all sugar is full? What have already done to the patient? Yeah, now we will keep the award. कुछ लोगों ने क्या उसको क्या सेक्सिस हो गया क्या हो गया कैसे हो गया ये वो इंजेक्टिंग इन द ऑरेंज इन द ऑरेंज ये वो इंजेक्टिंग इन द ऑरेंज ऑरेंज सो वो जब टू थिंग्स ये इंजेक्टिंग इन द ऑरेंज नंबर वन नंबर टू द इंसुलिन इस गॉन नंबर टू इस हैविंग ऑरेंज इन द एवरीडी बिकॉज़ दै so when using lanterns or gardening or whatever, uh, the effect tends to sometimes tail off. Not at all, tail off towards the last four hours. So if you have to put it at night, it's 10 o'clock, supposedly. So at 6-7 o'clock, it's not going to be effect. So that's, you have to be decorated with the same thing. Two years with the same thing. And one def very definite advantage of the short acting analogs would be, sir, like in the wards when sisters have to inject too many patients together, Maybe uh, having an analog rather than a gesture would be a much better thing. To do. Because analogs, the short acting like this pro can be given just before you start eating, even yeah. when the patient is starting eating. But you can't do that with the regular insulin, you know, insulin R or lactic. So likewise, you say very importantly that you have to tweak the regime as per the patient's requirements. Yes, of course. And in elderly and nephropathic patients, it's I think not advisable to change an HBA once you have seven. Try to, Absolutely. To, to basically individualize targets. Thank you so much for a brilliant lecture. I open the forum for discussion. So as, 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 I, as I get older, I realize more and more importance of counseling and education for the patient. We spent three days discussing one molecule and the features of the new molecule and how exciting it is. The patient is not having the medicine, not to stop the medicine, or is taking it the wrong way. So I think those things require more, not that new molecules are not important, but those things require much more emphasis than we are used to. As physicians, we are not trained. As physicians, we are trained to describe the blood drug. That is our training. But in chronic care, prescribing the best drug is only less than 50% of your, of your job. The patients don't take medicine, they take it the wrong way, everything is wrong. So that we have to invest in, in educating our patients. Otherwise, we will not get good results. Yes. Dr. Mithal, what a fascinating talk, sir. So, what did the 88, 2018 talk about insulin? They said, the aggressive glucose lowering may not be the best strategy in elderly patients. Yes, of course. And you need to visualize this stratification in all the patients. 100%. Sir, uh, 
what about the uh, see uh, glucose glycemia may not be may not produce the macrovascular events but hypertension and lipid probably will do that how is that yeah that's off the topic but i'll quickly answer it uh, we all know that it is not about a glucose centric approach we, we treat patients holistically these days anybody who's treating diabetes is a chronic care physician not a diabetologist not an endocrinologist when we started our careers, we used to fix the sugar and send the patient off. That is true. That is more than 30 years ago. Now, you do everything for the patient. You, you manage their lipids, you manage their blood pressure, you manage their day-to-day -day problems also. Otherwise, how will they run for a simple neck pain to another physician you know, or a headache? So, we are chronic care physicians. When we are looking at managing diabetes, it means managing glucose A, A1C. B, blood pressure, C, cholesterol. This is mandatory, this is part of our job. Any other questions? Sir, sir, I am continuing. Let others also, then I will come back to you. Sir, okay, then I am on, on, on his ortho para uh, position. Rapid as part, huh? yeah. Okay, so yes. I think that I deliberately, I just made a passing mention of it, but this is ultra fast, ultra fast, okay, as part, which means that it will act even faster than the one that you got, and you can give it comfortably immediately after eating also. Yeah. I don't know yet how much it will impact care. You know, we'll have to see how what impact it has, but it's an interesting. It's the same molecule, they managed to make it faster acting. Right. My last question, sir. Please. So, are insulin safe? See, this is a burning question. After the origin of the remote trial, yeah. it says insulin is safe. Yeah. But there are some misconceptions that insulin is not safe. Invented in 1921 by a patient surgeon, nine, we are now in 2018. So, Why are so, we reluctant? So, so yeah, I think that's I'm glad you raised this point. Because you're right, people still feel that insulin may not be safe. And I think uh, there is no doubt, uh, intuitively, it has to be safe. It's a part of our bodies, number one. Number two, it's been in use for 100 years and it's been safe. But studies have shown, established modern studies, and I was part of, I was country leader for both the studies, for, for uh, devote and virgin, where we look at insulin and cardiovascular outcome. And even in long term CV outcomes, there was a state where we were told insulin may be aphrogenic, it's a growth factor and all that stuff. But there's nothing like that. Insulin is absolutely safe for the heart. So the only side effects of insulin are over a period of time weight gain if you're not careful, and two, uh, hypoglycemia. There's no other side effect. So, um, may, I take, you, may, I, may I take from here? I'm a, just a project uh, thinker of the uh, insulin has yes. not cardiac friendly. We are discussing next year. Me, I, I request you to sure. give one more share. Sure, sure. So, uh, I will take your uh, question of Dr. Yes. Dr. Yes. Sen Gupta has said. Yeah, please. Don't give it the pill like she. Yeah. Dr. Yes. Sen Gupta had said. Dr. Sen Gupta had said that uh, not pricking the fingers and pricking the palm. Yes. How far we are from not pricking at all? You are not far. Just like uh, oh, uh, oximetry. I just told you that yeah. I, I expect that within a couple of years maybe you will stop it actually. Sir, or it will become very limited. In your question, in your case number 182 years may, how much we presume is the ATR part? 82 to 60 to There was one first patient is no, no, no. Suppose 82 years. Okay, suppose 82 years. Yeah. How much we, we expect the ATR part? Why, why are you asking that? Where did you because say? metformin, as you said, should continue. Uh, it is uh, okay. Yeah. If you are asking eGFR, metformin can continue even up to 30 eGFR. Yeah, not more than. No, so lower than that also. We put the study yesterday, yes. but we would follow up to 30. Yeah. And there is more and more evidence that low dose metformin is not in any way harmful, even in CKD. So I don't think we should worry. The study there was uh, comparison between glargin once and uh, mixed insulin therapy mixed uh, uh, twice. twice. 
So gelatin once and mixed, we are giving twice the uh, long again. So uh, is it is it a, a rational comparison? No, just comparing two regimens. You can say just comparing. There are also comparisons of once a day. I didn't show that. But in once a day, it's hard for anything to match up to gelatin or delivery because they control the fasting really well. So if someone has lean thighs, he has less muscle mass. So he is more prone to diabetes. And whatever fat is there, it is collected around the tummy in such people. Yeah. So you are right. Sir, I can say, men's are having more diabetes than the women's? No, 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 no. That's not true. Not anymore. Not yes. If you think that rest of the thigh is heavy, thigh you are saying, I am not saying that. I am telling you, Greater muscle mass and lower fat proportion protects you from diabetes. Lower muscle mass and greater fat accumulation, especially central, is a predisposing to diabetes. This is today's time for the same thing. This is thighs and heat ratio. Different US and Times of India. I'm not quoting anything here. Times of India it is. It's talking about maybe not, not talking, not referring to Serena Williams' right <laughs> Sir, last bit of question, sir. So you mentioned about uh, basal bolus and you said that you prefer basal bolus anyway or, or premixes. Yeah. But given the convenience of premixes twice a day, I would like to know is there any head to head comparison yes. till date which, which uh, measures the clinical outcomes of premixes versus not clinical outcomes, just glucose control and variability. Okay. So basal bolus is the preferred regimen. The only reason it is not used widely or used less is because of convenience. So it is my preferred regimen, but my patients don't prefer it many times. So I use a lot of premix. So what to do? I think there's no more questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Abhishek.